So uh, welcome everyone to our very exciting inaugural Roberta Ferenc lecture series today. Uh, we're really excited to launch this new lecture series. Um, so here's a bit of our uh, outline for today's session. Um, so we'll start off with some housekeeping items as well as uh, KMH's uh, land acknowledgement. And then the next 25 minutes or so, I'll hand it off to uh, Peter Selby and Roberta Ferenc uh, herself, who will speak a bit about um, achievements over the years in uh, the field of tobacco control and specifically uh, Roberta's uh, immense contributions to this. So looking forward to that. And then after that, I will hand it off to Joanna Cohen to take us through our educational hour. Uh, she'll be presenting on bridging the global research to practice gap to regulate e-cigarettes and optimize smoking cessation outcomes. And then at the very end, we'll have some time for a uh, question and answer period. Uh, so, so please note that the content of uh, Teach Educational Rounds, which is um, the Roberta Ferenc Lecture Series is accredited under, um, is centered on uh, evidence-based guidelines from the following sources. Uh, so nonetheless, these materials, as well as the verbal presentation, represent only general principles and they do not remove the need for clinical assessments or treatment plans by healthcare professionals. So here is uh, KMH's land acknowledgement. KMH is situated on lands that have been occupied by First Nations for millennia. Lands rich in civilizations with knowledge of medicine, architecture, technology, and extensive trade routes throughout the Americas. In 1860, the site of KMH appeared in the Colonial Records Office of the British Crown as the council grounds of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, as they were known at the time. Today, Toronto is covered by the Toronto Purchase Treaty No. 13 of 1805 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Toronto is now home to a vast diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis who enrich this city. KMH is committed to reconciliation. We will honor the land through programs and places that reflect and respect its heritage. We will embrace the healing traditions of the ancestors and weave them into our caring practices. We will create new relationships and partnerships with First Nations and MAT and share the land and protect it for future generations. Now, I invite everyone to introduce themselves in the chat and let us know which traditional territory you are joining us from today. Uh, if you're not sure, you can put that link in the chat where you can find out. And you're also very welcome to let us know something that you're doing to learn or improve your commitment to, to reconciliation. So I myself, as a white settler, acknowledge the privilege I have and am extremely grateful to work here at Intrepid Lab at KMH, where we ensure reconciliation is really intertwined within all the work that we do. Um, so I'll give everyone a moment to introduce themselves. And if you need a few more moments, uh, please do take the time to do so. And I may hand it off in the meantime to uh, Dr. Peter Selby, who will <clears throat> start us off with speaking a bit about the evolution of Intrepid Lab uh, and the STOP program over the years. Thank you very much. Um... And it gives me great pleasure to, to inaugurate this uh, idea. I'm going to start off with my work with nicotine replacement and, and nicotine, uh, working in the field of nicotine, uh, because, um, you know, I trained in 1994 to 95 in addiction medicine uh, at the original Addiction Research Foundation with a clinical fellowship, clinical research and scholarly fellowship. Uh, and that focus was primarily on um, obviously opioids were big at the time they continue to be big at the, and alcohol and there was just one small clinic uh that dr rick frecker who used to run and it used to be this you know tuesday afternoon kind of clinic that ran a uh, makeshift or pop-up clinic that we would go to and as a fellow i had no interest in it because i was dealing with real addictions uh, and, and, you know, I fast forward, I went off into, you know, after finished my fellowship, went established uh, work in the opioid field, both here at camp at ARF and then at 
at uh, St. Joseph's and focused on, you know, opioids mainly and pregnancy and opioids. And then really got interested in, in nicotine as we were trying to help all these women who were quitting uh, opioids, but couldn't help them quit uh, tobacco at all and and i was reading about the effects of uh, smoking on pregnancy and and its outcomes and always wondered how much of the outcomes in substance use were actually attributable to tobacco so that's where it started uh in getting me getting in, in interested in it and and at the time there were people who had heard about uh, you know, in, in the research side of things, both from basic sciences as well as population level sciences. And so in the basic sciences, there was a Dr. Bill Corrigal, William Corrigal, who was running animal labs and studies there. Uh, I heard about uh, Roberta uh, and Dr. Ferenc was, you know, doing something called Ontario Tobacco Research Unit. And it was all had to do with policy and those kinds of population level stuff that I had no interest in. It. But um, in 1998, CAMH was formed, and the Addiction Research Foundation was merged into CAMH, and um, and things were happening. And little did I know that you know there were people at CAMH who were doing a lot of work. There was uh, a, you know Dr. Lynn Kozlowski who was also doing some some you know, he was a psychologist who was doing work in that area, and you're beginning to see some of these these issues coming up. Uh, but I was busy dealing with opioids, um, and what happened is in 2000, I guess, because there were policy changes happening in the field and, you know, where smoke free policies were coming in and hospitals became smoke free. CAMH, which is a newly form formed organization, had lots of difficulty and um, a lot of things came together at that time. Uh, Bill Corrigal, Roberta and Bruna Brands, who is also a pharmacologist and worked, uh, you know, in, in addictions sort of said, you know, you should really consider working in this area. And there was a clinical trial happening. Bruna took me in on, on her wing and and Bill was also responsible for that. But that's when I got introduced to to Roberta. And at the same time, the management asked me to start a clinic uh, because we were having difficulty with everybody smoking everywhere, the city coming in, you know, giving chemate citations for for smoking, uh, indoor smoking. And um, I suddenly realized that we have to do a lot more. And as a result, that's when the clinic started and I had no idea what, was, what I was doing. So I said, I'll take the job as long as the clinical team and all of us can go to the best place to get trained. And that happened to be the Mayo Clinic uh, with Dr. Richard Hurt and his team was doing work. So we went down, we got trained up and then we came back. Um, and at the same time, I realized that for us to do anything meaningful, we needed to also uh, have a, a scholarly approach to this. And so since my interest was in pregnancy, we came back to pregnancy. We did we got a, our first project funded, which is called Pregnet, which is really an intervention project with healthcare practitioners and resources for women who are pregnant and smoking. And that was our first project. It was funded by Health Canada. Um, and I was able to hire one of the first staff, which was Rosa Dragonetti. Um, and then we started working from there. And of course, uh, with Roberta, I was pulled into Ontario Tobacco Research Unit and really got the mentorship to help thinking more broadly about smoking and tobacco, not just clinically, and thinking about how uh, taking a public health approach to this would be critical. Uh, so as things went on and as the Smoke Free Ontario uh, legislation came into Ontario, we got funding uh, because we were sending everybody to the states and, and we were approached to develop a training program in Canada that could save Ontario taxpayers money by having the training here rather than sending everybody to the U.S. Uh, so we uh, took that on, developed Teach, and we also got, uh, um, there was a, there was a, uh, at that time, a manage, uh, manager, director of the program of SFO, uh, John Garcia, who also happened to be a, you know, uh, um, very, very scholarly in his approach and very, uh, had come from the States, but was Canadian. And he really worked with us to think about how we could combine population level approaches to clinical cessation. And that's, he was really instrumental in helping. He was in the ministry at the time, helped us really move this needle forward around getting nicotine replacement out to people who quit. 
uh, who want to quit. Uh, so that's what happened. And we then started realizing that we, we were broadening. And so we became Nicotine Independent Services. Uh, and I really wanted to create it, create something that was integrated, that brought science, uh, clinical practice, education all together. Uh, and in 2007, CAMH had the standalone building at 175 College uh, at the foot of the university gates that we moved in and we created this, this community of, uh, of providers uh, where the clinic was happening at the same place where education was happening, at the same place where research was happening. Uh, because I believe that they needed to be connected. Uh, so that continued for a long time till, and we built out the program and continued to work with the ministry and got year to year funding uh, to make it happen. Um, and then around 2017, the funding for education stopped, but we figured out a model by which we could make it continue online, and we continue to do that. Uh, we then started branching out into from what we had learned with tobacco and the data coming back from tobacco, because we had added the number of scientists, was that what we were doing with tobacco that other people in other chronic diseases were saying, could we do the same? And you know, we kept getting approached to take our model and see can we apply it to other health conditions in the system. And so that's what the technology enabled collaborative care model came because by then we had all these collaborations with about 300 sites uh, in primary care, in community care, uh, and so that became the model for some of the uh, scale out of how we had done work with tobacco. Could we apply it to other health problems? Then the pandemic hit. Then we moved to our new space here at 1025 Queen Street. And we've got funding now to show that our model can work for other conditions uh, like diabetes, which is actually comorbid with smoking. And as a result, now that we've, we started off with two people in 2000, we are now 80. And so we thought it was time to continue our focus on tobacco and vaping and what have you. But given that we've expanded, uh, we needed to have a broader, um, a broader look. And so that is integrated nicotine, tobacco, research, education, programming, innovation, and, and digital health lab. Uh, it's a mouthful, I know, but I think it really um, encapsulates what we, what we do. So that's just a brief, quick history of, of us and where we are. And as part of this, uh, we've matured. The Ministry of Health has now made us a, uh, a continuing program. We don't have to go every year for funding. And so that has allowed us to continue to expand, stop into other sectors, such as long-term care, youth, uh, uh, cancer care, other places where, where people who smoke are, are still uh, attending uh, the health system. Uh, and has allowed us to innovate as well. So we're very grateful to the Ministry of Health uh, for that opportunity to continue to do this. And so um, uh, that's roughly where we are with that. So without much further ado, uh, I'd really like to, you know, uh, talk about this lecture series because as we have come into this work, we felt we needed to make sure we have this community of practice with stop and teach, uh, but we also wanted to amp up the, uh, the way that science and, and people who are experts in this space uh, can actually interact uh, with latest knowledge, latest thinking uh, beyond just looking at it uh, in, in journal articles, because we really want to make sure that we keep our practitioners, our implementers uh, inspired, as well as some of the questions that come from the field can inspire researchers to look into issues further. So this lecture series is meant to bring the best and brightest in the field. And, uh, and one of the ways we thought we would, you know, we spent some, a lot of time internally to think about uh, honoring uh, Robert, Dr. Roberta Ferenc's work uh, because, as some of you may know, she's now an adjunct professor at the Dallas School of Public Health at UFT and a senior scientist uh, at, uh, at uh, Emerita at CAMH. Uh, she was the Ontario Tobacco Research Unit's first executive director, and I, watching her, could see how she, one, brought people together, not only at the University of Toronto, but University of Waterloo, CAMH, as well as having a huge impact, not just in Ontario, but beyond. Uh, in graduate education, in policy, uh, you know, so, so that helped 
you really, you know, I thought it was really important for somebody like Roberta for us to acknowledge her contributions. And she was the, the executive director from 1993 to 2011. She started off with a master's degree in medical sociology and then a PhD in epidemiology from the University of Western Ontario. Uh, and she had been involved in tobacco and alcohol research for many years. Uh, her interests have included the epidemio epidemiology of tobacco use, alternative nicotine products, impact of tobacco policy on health, role of tobacco use and exposure and mortality and, mort mortality and morbidity, and the economic factors and smoking behaviors. More recently, she was involved in research on, the in, uh, on ETS, or environmental tobacco smoke exposure in public and private in, in environments. And I remember being part of her, uh, her study evaluating uh, the uh, Toronto bars, which went smoke free. We did a before and after study of bar workers. And that was just such innovation back then. Um, and it was amazing to work with Roberta on that. Uh, the behavioral and economic effects and restrictions on smoking, water pipe smoke exposure, and e cigarettes. So she has served on numerous commu uh, committees, task forces at the NCIC of Canada, Canadian American Cancer Societies, the uh, US Institute of Medicine, the US NIH, Health Canada, Ontario Ministry of Health, and she was lead editor on Canadian public health. And, you know, there are pictures there of Roberta, and I think each one of them, you know, shows how she worked with uh, our uh, keynote speaker today, um, Joanna. Uh, but also there is what you, you get to know about Roberta was her favorite animals, uh, pugs, <laughs> and I got to meet many of them and the love that she gave them was amazing. Uh, but as I was looking to, you know, Roberta is a person ahead of her time. She had a task force in, if, I don't know if you can see that slide, in March of 1994, a report on the task force on gender focused research. And I can tell you this was done at a time when People were not talking about it, and it's amazing how much is uh, still needs to be done in that space. And what is really interesting is that within our Intrepid Lab, we have a, at least three researchers who are now have grants and are focusing on uh, the issues around gender and tobacco, especially especially as as sex and gender issues around tobacco use as they continue, and especially quitting. So. Uh, uh, Roberta, I know this is the the long, uh, you know, trail effect of what you have started. And again, you know, I'm eternally grateful for your mentorship over the years, your your, uh, you know, your uh, generosity of spirit, and really has inspired me to try to to be at least ten percent as good as you were in helping others uh, launch their careers. So thank you very much, and uh, let me hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, you've done a very nice summary of, of my academic and um, scientific history, so that's very helpful. And I'm, I must say I was very surprised but delighted when P Peter first approached me about uh, this um, lectureship. And um, it's really nice that the speakers will go on when I'm gone, I hope, um, focusing on tobacco control and, and um, because periodically um, someone would say, well, tobacco is dead now. Nobody's smoking anymore. Um, it's not true, of course, but we have to keep bringing these things to people's attention. So I'm just going to say a few words about how this all happened. And I won't go into all the um, academic details, but I had an interest in tobacco from a very early age. I grew up in a house of smoke. Both my parents smoked constantly. I'm amazed I'm still alive. Um, I remember an early interest in addiction. I went to a, a movie with my mother when I was a child and we had to move up to what they call the smoking loges, which were the, the last few rows up in the balcony. And you were allowed to smoke there. They hadn't discovered the laws of physics at that time that smoke would uh, spread through the whole theater. So this made quite an impression on me. Um, 
And of course, I started smoking at 17. And my theory about that is that it was the first time I was out of the house for, um, I was away for the summer as, at a, as a camp counselor. And I think I was in withdrawal. And I started smoking and I smoked 10 cigarettes the first day and with no problem. So I think I already had a pretty high tolerance. And I did smoke till I was 25. And then I somehow managed to quit at the urging and threats of my father. I studied uh, sociology at U of T and got involved in survey research. And the first uh, couple of jobs I had after graduating, I did not want to go to grad school. Um, I wanted to work. So I went into market research and had uh, a very interesting few years doing that. Um, but after a while, you know, cereals and soaps were kind of boring. We did some health uh, studies, but most of it was uh, commercial. A few years later, um, well, I got married and we moved to Grand Bend. If, and if you know where that is, it's a little town on Lake Huron that grows to several thousand people in the summer. And I got a job at Western and commuted there for three years <clears throat> as a, a research assistant in the days when all the data were on computer cards and you had to carry big boxes over to the computer center. It was pretty terrible. <laughs> Later on, I uh, applied for and got a job actually as um, a director of a project. I just had a BA at this point, but those were the, the good days when you could didn't need a lot of academic training. And this was on self-injury. And um, it's, it's interesting because when I graduated from U of T, I was also offered a job at the Clark Institute, which I went to a market research company, but I ended up many years later back uh, at ARF and later CAMH, which <clears throat> joined with the Clark. So I, my life sort of came full circle. And on the self-injury study, there was a, a big component that had to do with drugs and substance use. So that certainly piqued my interest. <clears throat> and I interacted, br I brought in academics who um, kind of, I learned from them. They mentored me in how to write a journal article, how to get things published and so forth. Um, so that was that was very helpful. It was fun, funded by Health and Welfare Canada. It was called in those years and they funded us for five years, a total of $80,000. We were cheap in those years. The data that came from the self-injury study, people kept saying, well, you really have to do a master's. You've got all this data. And I finally thought, well, I guess I better do this. So I applied, um, at Western and did a master's in uh, medical sociology. Um, later, I was in London at the time, I moved to Kingston and after a while realized there was no way I was going to be able to do research in Kingston at ARF. So I started commuting to Toronto. I was able to get my position moved there and um, the first few years, I was mostly involved in alcohol and substance use, as well as gender issues. And um, I think I caused a certain amount of trouble because people didn't always agree with me. There was a lot of talk at that time about, um, you know, women were drinking heavily and th there was a lot of misinformation. And although I consider myself a feminist, I'm. A, I'm also a researcher and always looking for the truth. Um, I did stay at CAMH for the rest of my career, which was a great place to work, particularly because of the <clears throat> um, people from all different areas of science. And I remember once being at a meeting um, and there was another scientist from U of T there 
and he was a um, in a totally different area, a medical area, and I was a social researcher. But we were both doing a questionnaire. We were both developing a questionnaire on tobacco use and so forth. So I never forgot that, that, you know, there are these connections and the great thing about CAMH was that it was very interdisciplinary and we had this exposure to other people. When I finished my master's, my <coughs> advisor said at the little lunch they take you to after, now you have to do a PhD. And I said, oh no. At that time I had a full-time job and two kids and uh, I think I was still commuting at the time, but I, I wasn't living in London. So I registered and there was no sociology PhD at Western. So my advisor said, why don't you go into epidemiology? It's sort of like demography. And I said, okay, sounds good. So it turned out to be a very good choice because it filled out a, an area that I didn't know much about. Sorry, I'm being attacked by a dog here. In 1992, uh, Peter went over some of this, but the Ontario Tobacco Strategy was funded uh, for the province. And in 93, they set up the Ontario Tobacco Research Unit. And there was someone who was going to be the director. And one weekend, uh, some of you may remember Mary Jane Ashley, who's still around. Um, she was actually not only a tremendous support to me, she was one of our principal investigators, but she also brought Joanna in, so for which I am eternally grateful. Anyway, she um, called me one the long weekend in July and said, how would you like to be the director? And I said, can you give me till Monday to think about this? So that's how it happened. It was a bit daunting at the time. But um, it was a fantastic opportunity to work with so many excellent people. And at one point in there, I met Peter, and um, who was a, a physician who had an interest in substance abuse and tobacco. And as Peter said, um, it was I. I did encourage him. Like I do everybody. I mean, I, I'm a bit of a preacher about tobacco. So we've done a lot of exciting work and um, I won't go over because Peter's gone over this, um, but it was really quite exciting. And Joanna, of course, continues to do a lot of exciting work in tobacco policy, which is um, given short shrift in many ways. Um, Joanna and I also uh, taught a course for many years to uh, a graduate course. And uh, Michael Chaitin at CAMH is still continuing with this course, not quite in the same way, but so I'd just like to end with a, um, a quick story. Back in the early nineties, I guess, uh, Premier Harris, the conservative premier who, did a lot of bad things, um, made a public comment where he was arguing for practical education. And he said, at one point, he said something like, I'm paraphrasing it, what do we need sociology for? And he didn't know at that time that I was partially a sociologist and was being paid by the provincial government to do tobacco control work like he he had no idea so um, I also want to mention I did spend a whole summer in university on a uh, um, reserve in uh, on the Manitoba border and that that was an experience that really changed my life so I just like to end with all experiences are useful you may not realize it at the time but any, anything where you're out there doing stuff, observing, researching, or just experiencing is, uh, is so important.
So again, thank you, Peter, for setting this up and we'll look forward to Joanna's talk. And I will be introducing her now. Just a sec. So Joanna's the Bloomberg Professor of Disease Prevention. She's director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control and chair of the Department of Health Behavior and Society at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health um, in the US. She's been involved in tobacco policy research for 30 years. And she just, we don't know how she does it, but she's um, amazing. She completed her undergrad at McGill in physiology and came to U of T to obtain a master of health science and community health and epidemiology. Um, and she entered the doctoral program at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill in health policy. So she's very unusual compared to many people in uh, the tobacco area in, with her focus on policy. She joined OTRU in 95, where she was a principal investigator. Uh, she was also associate director for three years and then director of research and training uh, for six years. She conducts research and capacity building to inform and advance interventions. Sorry. To reduce tobacco caused death and disease. Her research focuses on factors that affect the adoption and implementation of public health policies and on evaluating the beneficial effects and unintended consequences. She's worked on studies of legislators. Sorry, just a sec here. I apologize, we've had some technical issues this morning. And I am doing this from my phone. Roberta, perhaps uh, Joanna Cohen can uh, help you out and maybe put miss uh, add anything that might have been missed in in her introduction. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful introduction and a few more a few more points. I apologize. Are, no, that's fine. Um, a few more points are on the slide, but I just wanted to say um, that I am really. Well, I don't know, Roberta, can I, should I just continue? I think we're good. Sure. I want okay. to give you the most time. Yeah. No, Thank that's you. wonderful. Thank you. Peter, any words or should I jump? No, no, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you for doing this, Joanne. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to it. It's been a long, long time. So great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I am actually filled with much emotion today. It's a tremendous honor to speak at the inaugural Roberta Ferentz Lecture Series. So thank you so much for setting this up, Peter, and for inviting me. I worked very closely with Roberta for 15 years and continued working with her. But I really want to take this opportunity to publicly thank Roberta for her tremendous impact on the field of tobacco control, but also for being sort of instrumental in my own career. I have learned so much from you and you uh, have provided me so many opportunities and I am tremendously grateful uh, for that. So thank you so much. Um, uh, and this is just a treat. And I'm wearing my CAMH colors today. I asked Natalie oh. to keep my 
my blue slides, but I've got my Cambridge colors on. So, um, so here we go. I'm really thrilled to be talking about um, e-cigarettes from maybe sort of an outside of Canada perspective, but I think many of the issues that I'll be discussing are, are particularly relevant um, wherever we're looking at regulation. So I'd like to, um, before I go on, uh, provide my land acknowledgement. I humbly acknowledge that the Johns Hopkins University, which is where I am today, is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of Indigenous peoples. Um, this campus resides on unceded lands of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples. I recognize the enduring presence of more than 7,000 Indigenous peoples in Baltimore City, including the Piscataway, Lumbee, and Eastern Band of Cherokee community members. I acknowledge the history of genocide and ongoing systematic uh, and systemic inequities that have occurred. And I give thanks to the past, present, and future stewards of this land and respect all tribal nations' sovereignty and right to self-determination. So I'll continue with my disclosures. The research that I'm going to be talking about has been supported by the National Institute of Drug Abuse and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Center for Tobacco Products. Um, and what I'm saying is just my views and doesn't represent anyone else's views. I've received other funding in the past five years from Bluebird Philanthropies, other grants from the National Institutes of Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and a group called Vital Strategies. And I have not accepted funds from the tobacco or nicotine industries. So um, this is sort of an outline of what I'd like to try and cover in the time that we have. I want to just give um, an overview of the regulatory challenges posed by e-cigarettes. I'll talk about the vapor study itself. And then a few words about methods to minimize fraudulent responses to online surveys, which I think is more and more relevant these days. Uh, I want to present a dashboard that we have prepared for regulators to see easily the data from the study. And then I'm going to present a few findings and, and sort of concepts about how we can think about the sort of research to policy um, application of when we think about e-cigarettes and what regulations are important. So I'll talk about three different issues briefly and then if there's time, present some resources, that, um, some free resources that are available. Um, here are the learning objectives that I set out. So I'd like to explain key strategies to maximize data quality from online surveys. I want, uh, I hope that after this presentation, you're able to identify one way to comprehensively think about e-cigarette devices and liquids. And then, of course, I'd love you to uh, take home and share some of the free resources uh, that are available related to e-cigarette regulation. So I'm going to start with some big picture um, ideas and likely a review for many of you. Um, so whenever we discuss regula the regulation around tobacco products, of course, we cannot ignore all of the challenges posed by um, the tactics and false arguments of the tobacco industry. So that is sort of always there. But um, e-cigarettes do pose their own regulatory challenges uh, first. E-cigarettes really are a heterogeneous product class. So the market is categorized by a diverse array of devices and liquids um, that differ in many ways. So devices can be disposable, they can be reusable, they can have adjustable components, for example. The 
where the liquid is stored. Um, it cannot, you know, it can be in a disposable pod that you throw away. It can be a refillable pod or cartridge. It can be in a tank of one of those larger devices. And then, for example, there's a lot of different characteristics of the liquid that is in e-cigarettes. So the, the actual concentration of nicotine, the formulation of the nicotine, whether it is um, a free base or, or salt based nicotine, Nicotine, um, the flavor, and a number of other things. So these uh, features can be associated with different user experiences, different patterns of use, the different, different delivery of nicotine, and of course, uh, user characteristics and preferences as well. Now, when we're thinking about regulation of e-cigarettes. Uh, I sort of summarize it uh, in these sort of two buckets, but that are important to look at at the same time. So one is we want to make sure that we're minimizing harms to both the population and to individuals. And we want to think about maximizing the benefits of these products to the population and to individuals. So what we um, want to try to do is better understand uh, these factors to inform effective regulation. So uh, what I want to focus on today and some of the work and you know a lot of the work that I've done in this area is to better understand what are the features of e-cigarettes that can maximize benefits and minimize the harms. So we can address that in our, uh, as we sort of educate policymakers or for regulation. So we developed the vapor cohort study to try and address some of these issues. Uh, the vapor stands for vaping and patterns of e-cigarette use research. Um, this was a collaboration between uh, Hop Johns Hopkins and Virginia Commonwealth University, which was the prime awardee of a FDA uh, Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science. So the, so the Vapor Study is one of the projects within that larger center. This is a longitudinal cohort study of U.S. adults, age 21 and older, who use ENDS, I'm calling it ENDS, so electronic nicotine delivery systems, um, because we're focusing on the e-cigarettes that do have nicotine in them. So you'll probably see N, I'll be mentioning, saying ENDS instead of e-cigarettes. Um, they're using these products at least five days a week. So we're looking at a particular population, adults who are using these products a lot, <laughs> okay? Um, so not the general population. Uh, but really want to understand, well, we picked this population because we wanted to understand um, the features of the devices and the liquids and what they're using and why and what sort of, what uh, behaviors it translates into. Uh, we recruited participants via Craigslist and um, we were aiming for about 1,200 participants each wave. Uh, so we had follow-up participants, but we also drew in new baseline participants to replace those lost to follow-up. Um, the survey collected self-report responses about people's uh, ENDS or e-cigarette use behaviors and the characteristics of their devices and liquids. But what we also did was ask people to submit photos of their devices and their liquids, and we coded those photos because a lot of people don't really know the exact nicotine concentration of the product that they're using or the exact you know, model of device. So, so we relied a lot on the photos. Um, so this is just a quick summary of the five waves of data collection we did, spend a course of sort of three years um, and, uh, as you can see in the column on the right, our follow-up rates uh, greatly increased eventually. We, we learned a lot during the course of this survey and uh, we, we really figured things out uh, as, as we went along and were able to increase the, uh, the follow-up rate. And basically there were, 
you know, around seven months or so between um, between waves of survey on average. I do want to point out that this was a convenient sample. However, we looked at the distribution of the participants by sociodemographic characteristics compared to um, the tobacco use uh, supplement of the current population survey, which is a general population survey in the US. And when we pulled out people who use um, e-cigarettes weekly, uh, daily, uh, our, the, the distribution of um, sociodemographic characteristics was very similar from with our survey and the general population survey. So we think this pretty well can generalize to the uh, adult users in the US who use e-cigarettes frequently. All right, so um, these days, um, you know, Online surveys are used more and more, and I want to share a story of our experiences in part of a as a warning for those doing online surveys themselves, but also those who are reading studies, uh, the papers that report on findings from online surveys. So one of the reasons why online surveys have become more popular is over time is that they have a lower cost and in general increased convenience relative to in-person surveys, mailed surveys, you know, people are on their phones. So um, so they're, they're sort of a bit more, more convenient. But what we have to be aware of is that there are many risks with these surveys, including bots and professional survey takers. And these uh, rep people, rep or things, issues represent um, challenges to data quality. So I'll tell you how we started. We were, we were naive, but I do have to say we were working with one of the top survey research um, groups in the country, in the US, and they told us that they've done this before and they have protections and, you know, it won't be a problem. So we had, as I said, we had aimed to recruit about 1,200 participants. And when we started with the survey research firm, we were using social media ads uh, in three US cities. And I can get into why uh, if you're interested at the end. The survey was anonymous. Incentives for completing the survey were delivered by email um, after people uh, completed the survey. And even though we were told that fraud detection software was used to prevent multiple completions by the same participant, uh, it turns out that maybe uh, that it wasn't full, full uh, uh, it, it wasn't foolproof. So, um, what happened was, you know, our recruitment began slowly, which is what we expected, you know, one to 10 submissions per day per city, because we were very targeted in particular cities and, you know, we had a specific target sample we were aiming for. But then it accelerated quickly and uh, we stopped data collection just to check on uh, how things were looking. And it turns out uh, we had we had about 1,600 survey submissions, and there was I don't know it took it took a little while, but we did a, a very in depth investigation, and in the end felt that only about 363 of those surveys could possibly be valid. Um, so we left that survey research firm and uh, headed out on our own. Well, we did a lot of research. We talked to um, p um, sort of online security people, people who worked for banks and um, whatever experts we could find to, to try and uh, educate ourselves about ways to minimize um, minimize these challenges and maximize data security. So we ended up with a range of um, strategies that we implemented. So, um, so a range of risk mitigation strategies. So first, people had to give us information about their identities. It was no longer anonymous. And we, were, and we, I, we verified their identities through LexisNexis, which is a database which provides names and addresses um, and various things. So we needed to pay for a subscription, but we did that. 
we had the CAPTCHA, which many of you are used to. We had two-factor authentications. We um, did data quality reviews ongoing as data were coming in. And to try to minimize the incentive for people to just complete a survey, we did not um, immediately send them their incentive uh, for completing the survey. The incentives were actually mailed to their address. So it took time, it wasn't immediate gratification. And we also knew that if the checks were, um, were returned, that maybe it wasn't a correct address. We did also transition to uh, posting through Craigslist, we, and we went beyond the three cities. Um, and this ended up reducing costs, it quickened recruitment, and I can say that data quality was high. Um, now, despite all these efforts, a sophisticated bot did breach our procedures, in part, we think, by using personal information that was probably obtained on the dark web. But we were able to identify those and the submissions were removed. And uh, we found, oh, and we also um, ended up requiring um, people to, it was not just optional, it was required to submit a photo of your e-cigarette device. And we verified photos, this obviously took some person hours, but we verified photos that they were unique and authentic. So anything that could be found on the web, anything that looked like they just went to a store and, and took the photo, you know, we, we did not include those people in our sample. And we also regularly reviewed open-ended responses. So since then, we completed five waves of data collection without any further um, Incidents. So I want to really, I'm telling you this story because I think it's relevant to tobacco research, but all research, like any topic these days, if you are doing online surveys or reading studies of online surveys, please um, be aware that it is really essential to have strong risk mitigation strategies to be implemented to ensure um, the data quality of your survey. And I think I was told that this group can be quite interactive. So I'm going to ask folks, you probably have um, experience with this, and I'd love for you to drop in the chat um, strategies that you've used to, um, to uh, mitigate uh, sort of false uh, survey responses in online surveys. So, we'll, so I'll keep an eye out for those. So I'm just going to transition um, to our dashboard for regulators. And, you know, the reason why we do this work and Roberta trained me and Peter and many others, you know, to really focus on the application that we really want to make a difference. It's not just ivory tower research that we're doing. So we're doing this work to inform policy and regulation to best um, achieve the regulatory goals, uh, in this case of minimizing harms and maximizing benefits. So we created, um, with the Vapor study, an interactive data visualization dashboard to allow quicker and more efficient data exploration by us, but also dissemination to our collaborators and federal partners, particularly FDA and, and NIDA. Um, and we used a HIPAA compliant SharePoint storage for the data. It was connected to Power BI um, and configured and designed to visualize the data. All this was done by uh, my colleague, Josh Son Sonoma, who is an amazing undergrad. You know, he has his undergrad degree, but you know, young people these days can do amazing things. Um, and so we have fe the features uh, allowed us to view over 9,000 possible combinations of descriptions of the sample across variables, and it would take like less than a second to generate each um, deployment. So I, because of time, I'm not going to show you the live version, but this is a screenshot, and you can see on the right that you can click on you know, what wave you want to see. So you can click on just wave five, you can look, click on all the waves, and the pictures are going to change as you click different waves. We also have cohorts. So right now, all the cohorts are checked off, but you can click, you know, the first cohort, the second cohort, whatever. And and the, the pictures that you see are going to change. We have, you can see the, across the top, you can look at the demographics of that 
sample that you click off, um, various behavioral outcomes, um, characteristics of the device, characteristics of the flavor, et cetera. So, um, this is this is the dashboard, um, and we the it was greatly appreciated by the funders, and it was also great has been great for data exploration. So, um, I want to transition again. So I shared some of the methodological challenges that we encountered and how we address them to get strong data, um, and then uh, quickly talked about an interactive way to share the findings with funders. But now, I want to um, move on to some substantive issues. Uh, that I think are really important to consider for regulation. So I'll be talking about three things. First, combinations of devices and liquids. Then I'll talk about nicotine flux and finally quitting. So um, it's important, I think, to be as we um, are considering what to regulate specifically and how to regulate, we have to think about these products comprehensively. These products are complex. As I said, the devices can be reusable or disposable. They can re be refillable or not, not refillable. The liquid container can be, you know, there's different kinds of liquid containers. Um, you can have adjustable settings, such as some devices allow the power or the coil, the power to be adjusted. You can switch out the coils. You can um, adjust the airflow. Um, and then again, all these liquid uh, characteristics characteristics that can be different. And if we, we know in tobacco that if you just focus on one thing without the bigger context, so if you squeeze a balloon in one place, it can expand in another. And we saw this with e-cigarette reg e regulation in the U.S. where um, the FDA sort of went after jewel products because of the epidemic of, uh, in, of use among youth. Um, so, real just honed in on the replaceable cartridges that Juul had, but then what happened? Puff Bar, which was a disposable device without those replaceable uh, pods, um, you know, took over the youth market. So you don't want to um, just squeeze in one place because we're just going to create new problems. So we have to think about these products um, comprehensively, and they do work as a system, both in terms of their nicotine delivery. But what goes along with the nicotine? Also the toxicants. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's there's flavor chemicals, there's the um, PG and VG sort of um, solvents and um, sometimes metals that leach into the liquid, et cetera. So all, you know, it's the delivery, all of these factors influence the delivery of nicotine, also the delivery of toxicants. And by studying key characteristics individually, we might miss or mischaracterize their overall relationships with the outcomes we care about. So this is a paper that was published in 2022 where we sort of presented the idea of combinations of electronic nicotine delivery system device and liquid characteristics. And um, this is one of the sort of figures in the in the uh, paper. I don't expect you to to uh, look at it carefully, but basically we um, we sort of categorize people by whether they're using a reusable device or not, whether their device was refillable or not, whether their what the type of de liquid container there was, whether it was a tank, pot, or cartridge, or refillable car pot or cartridge, and then whether it had adjustable settings or not, and then um, the liquid, uh, the, the nicotine formulation in the liquid. So whether it was a nicotine salt or free base, because that's um, highly correlated with the nicotine concentration. And then the darker um, shades of the boxes on the very right showed the most common combination, most common combinations, and I'll show this in an easier way now. So this was our, these are data from wave one. So remember, this is in 2020. Um, and these were the most common combinations of device and liquid pairings among our sample of U.S. adults using e-cigarettes five or more days per week. 
Um, so 40% of these people, frequent adult e-cigarette users, 40% were using sort of the tank or rechargeable tank device that you could adjust. It had adjustable settings. It used a free-based nicotine liquid that you would refill from a bottle of, of nicotine, you know, liquid, liquid nicotine. About 24% used something like a Juul, a Juul or something like it. So it's a rechargeable device. It does not have adjustable settings. It uses a nicotine salt liquid and a replaceable pod, which has the liquid in it. And we had 13% using something like a Smoke Novo, um, like a rechargeable device. It had adjustable settings, nicotine salt liquid, and a refillable pod. So it has a pod, but you can refill it yourself. So that's what things look like in our sample in 2020. And um, I can say we, in the paper, we sort of highlight the top five combinations. Here on this slide, you see the top three combinations. The top five combinations represented 94% of all the combinations in our, in, in our sample. So these, you know, these were really common combinations of e-cigarette devices and liquids. But if we fast forward to our last wave, wave five in, in um, 2023, just a, even less than a year ago, the picture changed. So now the most common combina combination that we saw in our sample of adult users using e-cigarettes almost daily, 33% um, were using like a puff bar, something like a puff bar. It was a disposable device. It does not have adjustable settings. It has a nicotine salt liquid. You don't refill it yourself. You throw it out when you're done. And you know, we went from 40% of our sample to 24% of our sample using sort of the, the tank system with the free base nicotine liquid. And then still, it was sort of similar around 12% were using the, um, you know, something like uh, Smoke Novo system, rechargeable with adjustable settings and a nicotine salt liquid and a, and a refillable pod. So, um, Analyzing these ENDS device and liquid combinations together rather than looking, just picking out one or two characteristics separately when you want to look at impact on um, various outcomes can allow us to better evaluate their relationships between use and key outcomes such as quitting and uh, quitting cigarettes or quit, even quitting e-cigarettes and, and abuse liability. All right, so um, I'm not too good at looking at chat, and <laughs> um, but uh, I did see a, a comment, uh, is the change connected the change connected to cost savings. Oh, like the amount that someone um, is paying. It could, it, you know, it's partly cost. Uh, oh, so obviously these devices cost a different amount, but I, it might also, and I, so I can't answer your question um, uh, uh, with full confidence, but in addition to cost, you know, there's the availability and ease of getting the products. So where you can buy them, um, and also sort of sort of the trends in what's being used. And I think, you know, the tanks um, might be more complex. Um, but also, again, these are just adults using e-cigarettes frequently. So they can be coming into this sample um, in a different variety of ways. And I'll say a little bit more when I talk about the quitting, what we found with quitting cigarettes. But first, I just want to talk about, so, talked about the importance of looking at these products holistically and to, and you know I just want to emphasize that a lot is going on in these products and we don't want to again sort of inadvertently squeeze one end of the balloon and create a new problem with our regulation but the other thing we want to um, keep in mind is to understand what is being emitted from these devices so what is the level of nicotine and um, toxicants being omitted? So e-cigarettes can deliver, you know, in a few puffs, much more or much less nicotine than cigarettes, depending on a lot of factors. 
like the power, the geometry, the liquid composition, and the puff behavior of the, of the user. So the concept of nicotine flux is the idea of the amount of nicotine or the rate of nicotine emitted from a device per puff second. And it can help us account for the total dose of nicotine and the rate at which nicotine reaches the user, which we know are key factors in drug abuse liability. So this idea of nicotine flux uh, has been put forward by Alan Shahade at the, from the American University in Beirut and Tom Eisenberg of Virginia Commonwealth University. And here's one of their key papers laying out, um, laying out this idea. And um, in a different, in an earlier paper, they sort of um, presented some of the um, factors that again would impact how much nicotine a user is getting. So there are various design, basic design features of the device. There are factors related to the heating element, and there are a range of factors there. There are factors related to the liquid itself, um, and then the user behavior, how the, um, the puff duration, the interpuff interval, the number of puffs, things that, um, you know, we know very well from uh, research with cigarettes are important as well. So if the flux is too low, um, then users will likely abandon the device and maintain potentially can, um, you know, cigarette use. If we're thinking about e-cigarettes trying to help people who use cigarettes quit using cigarettes. So you want enough, you don't want flux to be too low because you want the user in that case to get enough nicotine. And we can also speculate that if the flux is too high, individuals may suffer toxic side effects or, um, or importantly, the device may have higher than necessary abuse liability. So by considering sort of the e-cigarette design, the conditions under which the device is being used, the liquid composition and the actual puff behavior in combination, I think we can you know, really understand and better, better um, think about uh, regulation of these, of these products. So I just wanted to sort of introduce you to that idea that, again, it's not, you know, there's a lot of things going on and we have to be aware of it if we want to inform regulations that will actually be effective at minimizing harms and maybe maximizing benefits. So then I just want to move on to um, quitting cigarettes because in the end, you know, what else? There's no other reason for e-cigarettes to be on the market than potentially to help people who smoke cigarettes quit smoking cigarettes. They shouldn't be used by anybody else. Um, but maybe, you know, how can we um, get to an e-cigarette that's most effective at helping people quit smoking? And you'll see that in a lot, of, in the research that has been done uh, so far, it doesn't really get into a lot of the factors that I've talked about already, sort of, how, what is the nicotine um, flux of the products that are being studied, for example? So my, you know, I was, I'm really interested in trying to understand if there are device and or liquid characteristics that might be appropriate regulatory targets to maximize the ability of e-cigarettes to help people stop using cigarettes. Because in the end, that's the only reason why they would uh, be available. So again, we use the vapor study. So this is again, just reminding you um, about who these people are. So adults 21 years and older who are using ENDS frequently, at least five days a week. And for, um, the, the results that I'm going to show you, we looked at people who completed at least two consecutive waves of the vapor study. So either wave three and wave four, and the dates are there, or wave four and wave five. Um, so, you know, seven to 12 months sort of on average later, have they quit and what devices were they using? So, 
Participants provided details about their most used ENDS device and liquid, um, their cigarette and ENDS dependence, the number of years they used cigarettes and used ENDS, uh, other tobacco product use, the reasons for continuing to use ENDS, et cetera. So we had a lot of great variable um, important um, constructs that we measured. And so quitting cigarettes for this analysis was defined as smoking cigarettes at either wave three or wave four, and then no longer smoking cigarettes at the subsequent wave. Now, I realize that this doesn't adhere to our, um, uh, like our clinical trial definitions of quitting smoking, where we want people to quit at least quit smoking at least for at least three months, or sometimes at least six months, sometimes at least a year. Um, but it's preliminary, and uh, you know we have to work with data that we have. Um, now we did use post stratification survey weights. Um, I can get into that, but um, and then we. Um, did some significance testing. Now, at this point, I don't have the multivariate models. These data are sort of hot off the press and I'm planning to present them at the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco meeting in, in a couple months. So we'll, we'll have moved forward have, um, by then. So these are really um, uh, not the multivariate findings, but this is what we have so far. So first of all, it's important to note that two thirds of our participants did not smoke in any wave, uh, in wave, you know, three, four, five. So they were omitted from our analysis. So most of the people in our sample did not also smoke cigarettes. We had um, just over a fifth, 23% who smoked at both waves, so they didn't quit, sm quit smoking cigarettes. And we had 10% or 11% who smoked at one way, but were not smoking at follow-up. It's 128 people, and these are the folks that we looked at to see if there were any relationship um, between with their device and liquid characteristics and then not smoking at follow-up compared to those who continued smoking or smoked at both waves. So, um, Unfortunate. Well, not unfortunately, but what we found was a number of factors that I thought might be associated with no longer smoking cigarettes were not associated with, I'll say, quitting for shorthand, with quitting smoking at follow-up. So device type, nicotine formulation, nicotine concentration, reasons for continuing to use ENDS, years of ENDS use, the, we looked at the combinations, none of that was significant with no longer smoking at follow-up. However, um, I guess this gave me a little more confidence in the findings. Factors associated with no longer smoking at follow-up were things that you know the literature tells us would be. So um, they no longer smoked at follow-up if they had a fewer year total years of smoking cigarettes, if they smoked fewer cigarettes per day, if they had lower cigarette dependence, if they had higher ENDS dependence, if they were more likely to use another tobacco product, a type of tobacco product, and we also have some findings about cannabis, which I have to think about a little bit more. So factors that you would normally expect to be associated with quitting smoking cigarettes um, were, and not our, not our sort of detailed device and uh, liquid characteristics. Now, so a few things, first of all, we, it could be due to a potential lack of power or the follow-up was too short to detect significant associations with device and liquid characteristics, but also the device and liquid characteristics that we looked at may be less important because people can easily self-dose based on their level of addiction. So, you know, we probably could benefit from some puff topography data to know exactly the nicotine dose that pe that people are experiencing from their device. And then, um, you know, we did look at a particular sample, people smoking, smoking cigarettes, but also using ends at, um, at least five days a week, almost daily. Maybe it would be different for people using um, e-cigarettes for uh, less frequently. So I'm just going to jump to a summary of what I presented because I want to um, leave enough time for questions and your your you to share your insights. Uh, 
uh, about about this, uh, the, you know, these topics. And again, in the chat, if you want, I'd love to hear your clinical experience. You know, I think we have a lot of clinical folks. So any of your clinical experiences related to quitting smoking using e-cigarettes, and maybe you've seen patterns that um, we weren't able to detect, and maybe I can try and look for them. So just um, before I f end off with some resources, just in terms of summary, um, two ways, there are a couple of ways to look at key characteristics of e-cigarettes together. So I talked about device liquid groupings or combinations where we can try and look at sort of the these um, entities comprehensively or holistically. And I also presented the concept of nicotine flux that depends on a lot of factors, but that eventually is important for regulation because we want to know how much nicotine and other toxicants the user is, is getting. Um, so our initial analyses suggested that device liquid groupings and individual characteristics of these devices and liquids were not associated with not smoking uh, seven to 12 months later. But And then we do want to, we'll have some calculations of nicotine flux to do, and we'll be looking at that moving forward. So just to end, uh, I want to just present you with some free resources that maybe can be beneficial to you. So we do have um, a global E scan, policy scan of sort of e-cigarette policies, policies related to heated tobacco products, and policies related to nicotine pouches by country. Uh, so we have um, like 194 countries in our in our policy scan, and you can look, you can search the database. We update this twice a year. We verify the information within country experts. But the great thing is you can, like these circles at the bottom, you can stratify by policy domain. So if you're interested in taxes on these products, or if you're interested in which countries don't allow use of these products in public spaces, or which of these countries um, restrict the advertising and promotion of these countries. So that's a policy domains. We do categorize by regulatory mechanism. So is it a regulation, a law, a decree, et cetera? You can search by country. And we also have um, how the country classifies the product. So does it classify e-cigarettes or nicotine pouches as a consumer product, as a tobacco product, as a nicotine product, et cetera? So all that can be found. Um, uh, in the interactive policy scan. All of these resources you can find at Global Tobacco Control, all one word, globaltobaccocontrol.org. Um, just, we have Tobacco Watcher, which is an automated surveillance system that uses artificial intelligence of media stories around the world um, related to tobacco. So we've trained computers to um, to look at tobacco related stories. Um, so you can set alerts, you can add that has an analysis function, et cetera. So um, that's, it's called Tobacco Watcher. If you want to look at them, how the media is covering these products, uh, Tobacco Watcher, you can also find it at globaltobaccocontrol.org. Um, I think, you know, the, the words we use for these products is really important. So, um, you know, there, I say we shouldn't be doing the tobacco industry's dirty work for them by using words that benefit um, the tobacco industry's um, sort of arguments. Uh, so there's a little video, I think it's three minutes to explain, um, you know, words that we can use to talk about these products. And then we have some free online courses uh, there's global tobacco control, learning from the experts. We have a course specifically for healthcare professionals, and Peter's one of our um, experts in that course. So this is a shorter course, but um, for busy healthcare professionals to focus on how they can, it talks about some clinical issues, but also how they can be, um, how they can contribute more broadly. Um, to this area. And then we also have a course on tobacco and COVID-19 that we're just updating now. So I, I want to stop there and leave time for um, your comments and insights. So thank you very much. And I don't know if you want to, uh, I'll leave it to Natalie whether she wants to keep the slides up. Oh, one more slide actually. Um, you can use this QR code to get directly to more information about the vapor study if you'd like. So thanks, thanks very much. 
Thank you so much, Joanna, for such a wonderful presentation and taking us through some challenges and solutions you've come up with through your vapor study and those uh, excellent uh, resources. Looks like we do have um, some questions already in the chat. Um, let's see, let's go back up. Uh, Mohammed says, um, this is a great question. I have a question, uh, this is a great study, but I have a question. How many quitted smoking but started ends? And is that not continuing nicotine intake? Is it only harm reduction way? Great, yes, so I can't answer your question. That's a wonderful question. Um, so again, for our sample, we started with people who are already using ENDS because that was the sort of the main research questions of this study. But of course, um, your question is really important for the broader sort of regulatory and policy perspective. So, I, you know, this study is able to answer some of the questions, some important questions, but not all the important questions. So, um, I think that's um, that's really key. I'll just say, because um, I have the floor, um, and um, in terms of the video, maybe I can send it to Natalie, because I'm not good at talking and finding things online at the same time, so I can send you the link and any other resources that you can share with participants. But I personally try not to use harm reduction when I talk. I didn't use it at all during this presentation because I think it can be very distracting and it means different things to different people. So if we're talking about using a cigarettes to quit smoking cigarettes, I'd like to just say that. <laughs> if we're talking about using e-cigarettes to cut down on the number of cigarettes someone is using, I'd like to say that. Because um, I think, it, again, it can mean lots of different things. And of course, as you know, the tobacco industry has co-opted this term and is trying to whitewash um, and uh, make their products sort of fit into a public health paradigm, despite all the aggressive marketing and and huge use by youth and, and non cigarette users. So, so I like to try and avoid that term and be much more explicit about what, uh, what we're at, I'm actually trying to communicate. Um, youth, great question about youth. Um, don't know, but I mean, I guess it's probably not combinations. I mean, we know that in general, youth are using the cheaper products, the more accessible products, at least in the US. I think it's pretty similar in Canada. So, um, Roberta and Peter can speak to that, but I expect it's, you know, it's something equivalent to the puff bars, the disposable, um, the disposable products. And actually I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know where regulation on jewel stands in Canada at this point, maybe you, so I don't know if that's. A popular device, but youth have moved away from that in the US because in the US, they don't have all the all the flavors. All right, looks like Ryan has another uh, question. Is there research around the heating point when vaping uh, different products and if it melts the product leading to ingestion of pieces of the, of the vape? That's a good question. I have not heard about that, but maybe other people have. Um, and again, probably those who um, interact with patients probably hear a lot more stories of what happens. Um, so that might happen. What we do know is that um, both through leaching um, and just sort of the processes, we, we do have evidence that metals from the device from the coil do end up in the liquid and can end up in the aerosol as well. So, um, so I don't know if it's in general, like plastic pieces, but we do see that some of the metals do, um, do end up in the aerosol. And please like, um, Peter, Roberta, please add to, to my, feel free to add to my responses. Lori had a question there. Do you see that? Uh... <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Lori. And I miss you. I hope I see you again soon. Um, uh, so, you know, this is a tough question as well, because 
we don't get everything from the photo of a device. Um, so, for example, when you get like a, a disposable device. Um, there's very little information on the product or when you go online to try and find details of the voltage and resistance and what the nicotine concentration is, it's we've had a really hard time finding that information for particularly for disposable devices, which now we're seeing are sort of increasing in in popularity even among adults um, and even among adults uh, who are trying to quit smoking. Um, the photo, so the photos are, we found the photos have been great for the other kinds of device types, but just, you know, as a warning, or just as a heads up, it takes a lot of person hours to code those photos. So we had a big team, people reviewing photos, then doing sort of the online research. I mean, we did create a database. So if we came up, if there was a new device, um, you know, that, that so if we had a device already in our database, that was quick. Uh, there are so many devices and models out there that they're all different. So um, it ended up being every way. We still had to spend quite a bit of time coding new ones. So, so I think the photos, the photos can be helpful because um, you know there's certainly been been research um, published that people don't know a lot of the details about what they're using. But um, but it does take um, person hours to uh, to use them. Thanks, Joanna. Looks like uh, Peter has a question. Do your, does your data suggest there are robust classes of people who vape? Thanks. So uh, yeah, I don't have a, a picture of it, but we recent I I think we recently published a paper because we wanted to see if these combinations of devices and liquids that we sort of theoretically sort of created, whether that came out as a latent class in the data. And we found that actually it did. Oh, um, so uh, we have I'll, uh, something else for me to send, Natalie, I can send you that citation. So maybe, you know, that was good. <laughs> um, and we talked about the, the sociodemographic characteristics, which I can't, I'm not prepared to speak to right now, but unfortunately, but yeah, go ahead. No, that's great. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, so Juul has really, you know, as you know, in Canada, there's 20 milligram per mil, at least from legal vapes as the maximum amount of nicotine per mil, right? So 20, 20 milligrams per mil is the max. Of course, there are, you know, these are refill pods. People can certainly get, we do have patients who get more higher concentration nicotine, whether it's a salt or not salt, they don't have any idea, but they, for their refillables, they can get illicit uh, uh, higher concentration still. But legally, uh, but what we are seeing again is that uh, people, uh, Juul is not what they're coming in with. They're using more views. That seems to be what's being marketed and acceptable. I guess it's availability. And then the disposable ones are especially for our older in the clinic. The older patients don't like the fiddle. You know, they just want something they can throw away because it's the ease of use is what matters. They don't want to refill something. They don't want to change a part. They, you know, they need something big enough for themselves. And yeah, you know, I guess so. I think we need to do further research around that. But if there are any. Uh, you know, country differences or regional differences, but that seems to be what we are seeing. I would imagine I would, from a population level, I would defer to Dave. Uh, I'm, I don't know if he signed up today, but Dave would be my go to for what's happening here. Yeah, that's great. And are you finding any of your patients who smoke cigarettes are able to quit with the disposables? Have they been successful? Yeah, we have two categories. One, is those who are coming to quit vaping. They tend to be younger people who are saying, I've been vaping and I'm having a hard time quitting. That's one category. And then, then you do have this older category who, who have successfully switched, but then they're coming to quit vaping, you know, a few months or years later as well. We don't know about the people who switched completely, are com you know, comfortable with it, are happy with their switch over and aren't actually seeking to quit nicotine. They've just made a switch. Uh, we don't see those people at all, obviously, because ours is a treatment seeking group. So. It looks like uh, 
looks like we have one more question. I know we're about to uh, run out of time. Maybe we can quickly answer this one and then we can wrap up. So uh, Louis, uh, Louis Philippe is wondering, um, curious why the survey only included people over 21, if it would have been relevant to aim for a younger population group. Um, absolutely. Yeah, we need to definitely understand the younger population group because they're, they definitely should not be using these products. Um, but I think uh, there were a couple of reasons. Again, there were specific um, research questions for this study around device and liquid characteristics and um, predominant and nicotine flux and understandings. And we just needed people who were, well, partly um, we were also going to originally bring people in for puff topography and then to try and do a longitudinal study in five years and get the informed consent and recruit kids as well as you know adults it was just going to be a little to like get their parents consent it was just going to be a little challenging it's and partly doing during covid right so so we focused on adult users where we didn't and there's also because in the US, um, it's illegal to buy cigarettes and e-cigarettes under, not to buy, but to sell e-cigarettes to people under age 21. So we didn't wanna have any issues with um, ethics and talking to people who, you know, there could potentially be, I don't know, it was just gonna be easier to focus on that age, but you're absolutely right. There's a lot of, um, this would just be as, um, equally and maybe even more important in a in a younger age group. So thank you for that question. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joanna, Roberta, and Peter for an amazing uh, inaugural Roberta Ferrans lecture series. I know we're out of time now. So if anyone does need to head out at this time, please feel free to do so. I just have um, some housekeeping um items to go through but if uh any of the three of our panelists have any last words before i do so i just want to say thank you so much natalie for this and of course thank you to robota and you joanna as well it's really great to see both of you and hopefully we can do this in person but given where we are at and this seems to be the most reasonable way to do it so thank you Thanks. i want to thank joanna for a fantastic yeah. presentation uh, the challenges that we don't didn't have to face. We didn't have yeah. bots in those days. And Peter yeah. for, or, uh, you know, coming up with this idea and following through on it. And Natalie for her wonderful organization of the session. Yeah, great. And all of you for participating, those who are still online. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye Bye. to those that need to head out. And I'll just quickly kind of go through some uh, housekeeping items for those that are uh, interested. Um, so if you're interested in receiving a letter of completion uh, for the session, just make sure you uh, registered and completed the pre-learning assessment. And we'll send uh, the post-learning assessment to you um, by the end of today. And you'll have one week uh, to complete that. I uh, just want to take some time to also let you know about our upcoming teach educational rounds on February 21st on optimizing cessation outcomes in black communities throughout the greater Toronto area. So look out for registration information on that shortly. Um, and if you happen to have missed a portion of today's session and want to view it again or uh, see a previous Teach webinar, an archive can be uh, found on our website. And last but not least, thank you so much again to everyone uh, for joining. And thank you so much uh, again, Roberta, um, for uh, this amazing inaugural uh, Roberta Ferrans lecture series. We look forward to, to future ones. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.